Heartland Highways is made possible in part by Consolidated Communications, offering customers high-speed internet, phone service, and digital TV service packages that include high-definition channels, DVR, and hundreds of sports, movies, and music channels. More information on these services available at Consolidated.com. Just ahead on this week's edition of Heartland Highways, we'll visit a family who runs side-by-side -side bed and breakfast in Arcola, Illinois. Then in rural Charleston, we meet Ray Meesman, the self-proclaimed pack rat who has turned his collection of historic items into a museum. Also in rural Charleston, we'll spend some time at Wes Whiteside's five-acre garden. Here, Wes grows plants, flowers, and trees, many of which are not native to Illinois. That's next, so stay right here. Welcome back to Heartland Highways. This week we're at Pemberton Hall, which was built in 1909 thanks to a man named Stanton Pemberton. Now, he was an Illinois senator who was very influential in getting the money approved for this building. At the time, this was Illinois' only state-funded residence hall, and today it's the oldest women's residence hall in Illinois. Not to mention, it's a historic landmark. While Pem Hall has been a second home for many female EIU students for more than a century, the family you're about to meet has been welcoming people into their home for more than 20 years. The Harshbargers are now second generation innkeepers and they run side by side bed and breakfasts in Arcola, Illinois. Overall, I think people come to uh, sort of get away and relax and feel like they're at home and a nice safe place to come to. So. They get all of those experiences when they come here. So. I think it's been a development for our family. At first, Bill was not real enthusiastic with the idea of having people come into your home. And um, he's found that it's been very enriching. When Bill and Lynn Harshbarger decided to purchase their 1864 Victorian Italianate home in Arcola, Illinois, they never intended to run it as a B&B. By 1988, however, they were soon to be empty nesters, living in this large home by themselves. After encouragement by neighbors, family, and the community, they decided to open their doors to the public. Bill would not let me advertise at all or say anything about the fact that we were going to do this. And so it was in June and everything was already published. So our first year was we were just getting into it. It was really, really fun. And uh, then we progressed and uh, we actually flourished when Midwest Living discovered us by chance. The flower patch, named after the many patches of flowers and beds that Lynn developed on the property, has welcomed guests from around the country and the world. I think a lot of things that happen to guests here, they get to meet nice people. And it's one of the surprises of a bed and breakfast is that we have them all at the same table. So they have a chance to hear each other's stories. Occasionally they actually find out that they're neighbors to each other when they didn't realize it. Using their own experiences and backgrounds, Bill and Lynn wanted to share their love for cooking and unique tastes with their guests. They also wanted to provide something more than just food on a plate, but rather an experience, hence their famous seven course breakfast. It came about because I always grown a lot of things and we've always had gardens and we also ate what we produced. So therefore um, it was a normal thing for us to have vegetables and green beans and for breakfast and, and um, that was just, uh, we didn't serve cold pizza <laughs> in other words. Breakfast starts with a fresh fruit compote and their signature and secret recipe, angel biscuits and muffins. The main courses consist of unique vegetable, potato and meat dishes, each artfully garnished with edible flowers and herbs from Lynn's garden. 
The meal is topped off with a dish called surprise. And everyone passes, uh, it's all passed around and put on their main dinner dish. And then with the uh, a person who's designated, uh, they count one, two, three, go, and everyone enters their surprise at the same time. So sometimes we serve dessert too, but we didn't this morning. <laughs> Guests enjoy their meals on beautiful place settings of china and stemware, another flower patch trademark. We have a lot of family pieces because my heritage is English. We have probably enough dishes to last for at least two weeks and then I get to go buy more dishes. Now we change our settings every day that everyone sits, uh, at, or if you're here for five days, there's a different setting at the table. Uh, all those five days. So if you stayed two weeks, I get to go buy more dishes. But if she can't buy them, Lynn will just paint them as she is also an accomplished porcelain artist. The family tradition of innkeeping is now a second generation business with the addition of son Daniel, his wife Tammy, and son Julian. I realized that this was a good place to live and, and raise a family, so I came back and I went into business with mom and dad. And, you know, as they got older, then I decided that it would be a good idea to keep the family tradition going. And uh, the house came available next door. And, and so it was just a natural transition for us to move down here, raise the family, buy the house, and go into business with mom and dad. And it's actually been a very good blessing for us. In contrast to the Victorian style of the flower patch, the Diamond House, named for the family that built the home, reflects the prairie school design of architect Frank Lloyd Wright. The, the house is simple, it's not cluttered, it is simple but contemporary, and uh, it has a lot of straight edges to it with the woodwork and whatnot, and it has a lot of windows on the east side, so it really does bring in that sunlight in the morning. And, the Diamond House has seven guest rooms, some of which are suites, and the Flower Patch offers five rooms. Guests who stay here can take advantage of the gardens and quiet spaces of both homes. Breakfasts are usually served in the Diamond House dining room. Meal preparation involves the entire family, with Dan now taking the lead role as head chef. I brought my experience to the table and, and, and incorporated some of my ideas into their, their meals and enhanced them. And so it is family recipes, it is family ideas, it's, it's creativity. In addition to the bed and breakfast aspect, the Flower Patch and Diamond House offers a number of other activities, including English high teas. This was Lynn's idea and answer to the traditional holiday open house and it's grown in popularity. We have the sandwiches, and we have the sweets, and we have the, the cake, and we have uh, fine china. Um, we have little vignette seatings. Uh, your party may be six, or maybe you might even have a whole group that will come of, of, of 15, 12 to 15 people. Those wishing for a special dining experience can come for six-course gourmet dinners in which Chef Dan will serve up unique dishes that you won't find on most restaurant menus. Whether they're taking care of overnight guests or greeting a daytime visitor, the Harshbarkers make it their mission to treat everyone like one of the family. It's always about the people. Yeah, the people are the most interesting thing. They all have life stories, they've all done things. Uh, they have interesting stories to tell. We always enjoy listening to what they have to say. I like to sit at the table when I can and ask them questions and find out about them. We really value and know that the customer values the experience. And so we spend a lot of time with the customers, nurturing those relationships and, 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 and creating, creating a bonds that uh, you know, last a lifetime. Although he doesn't host a bed and breakfast, Ray Beesman does host tours. Ray has what he calls a barn museum that has items cataloging life on the homestead all the way back to the 1800s. Sometimes, to get a good historical perspective, you don't have to look any further than your own backyard. That's exactly where we found Ray Meesman and his barn museum, right outside our hometown of Charleston. 
While some may consider Ray a collector, he actually considers himself more of a pack rat, a quality that's allowed him to preserve hundreds of historical items found in his museum. Most of it we just, we, you know, just kept it or inherited it or something my parents had or my uncle had or whatever. And so it's kind of a, just a fun thing that we uh, wanted to do. It was something that I had to find a place for my stuff <laughs> or throw it away. And Ray did find a place for everything. He built custom rooms in the barn's loft to display his items. Uh, I don't know what to actually call it. I like old radios. I like uh, uh, candies can for all in my uncle's shop or out buildings and they were going to throw those all away. They're not mint condition, but they, they just don't make them anymore. And the next thing is the dairy, anything that pertains to kind of dairy. There's a churn in there, hand turned by hand, of course. Moving on down, we have an old country church and the pews came out of a, an old church, I'm not sure where. And then the crowd up there was my uncle's, he was kind of a uh, religious fanatic, I guess. And uh, so he had that cross on his front porch. And he burned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then we might move on down to the uh, old country school. Uh, the school desk and the teacher's chair and a globe uh, all came out of the rural school that I went to for eight years. The name of that school was Glasgow. Uh, I made a bell for you out there and you can actually ring the bell. I've got a blacksmith shop and uh, it's uh, got a forge and an anvil, uh, grindstone, and some of the, some of the blacks and blacksmith's tools. One item in particular was an interesting discovery. Before my time, and I was born in 1929, and before my time, my father uh, blew straw in here with a threshing machine, and they put straw in here about uh, eight or nine foot thick. And so they, he left it in here, and I never seen this floor uh, until, uh, for 70 years. And underneath that straw, when we cleaned this barn out, the only thing we found that was completely under the straw was this grain grater. And this grain grater, uh, the strangest thing about it, it was in mint condition. It looked good. It looked just like it does now. And, but the only thing we couldn't find was the crank, hand crank. You had to crank it by hand. And the fellow that was helping me clean the straw out of here said, well, maybe they just got tired of turning it and threw the crank away. Ray's museum seems to have everything representing farm life over the last century, but it didn't take long before friends and visitors told him he was missing one thing. Everybody told me I didn't have a saloon, and everybody said, well, you need a tavern, you need a saloon. So I tell people now, if you came to have a drink, well, I'm sorry, but they're all empty. Uh, usually Germans were, uh, they usually smoked, they usually drank beer, and they uh, uh, drank a lot of coffee. Well, to begin with, I'm not a coffee drinker, I'm not a smoker, and I'm not a beer drinker. And so far in my lifetime, I've only consumed a half a bottle of beer. And uh, about three years ago, I was at the doctor's office and the doctor said, well, he said, now the medication I'm going to prescribe to you, uh, Ray, please don't take any alcohol with that. Don't drink any beer. And I said, Doc, you don't have to worry about that because I've only had a half a bottle of beer in my lifetime. And he, but I said, now, Doc, I said, if I'm privileged to celebrate my 80th birthday or my 60th wedding anniversary, I said, 
I may, just may, drink that out of half a bottle of beer. And he said, you got my permission. <laughs> the museum is situated on Ray's family farm, which has nearly a century of history all on its own. The barn was uh, uh, built uh, by the name of, uh, a man by the name of James Brown, that originally bought the land here in about 1856. He probably built the barn, the house, uh, homesteaded it, as they called it. And uh, then my grandfather, uh, Herman Meesman, bought the, bought the farm uh, in about 1899. And that's the year my father was born. And the barn was just uh, what they called a salt box. It was just uh, straight. It didn't have a side shed, it didn't have a loft. And in 1908, when my father was nine years old, why they remodeled the barn. And with a little updating of his own, Ray has been able to share the past with visitors from all over. Not only can he tell you about the items in his museum and the vehicles in his farm machinery building, he can tell you about the times they came from too. You could take a dollar bill and you could go to town and you could have, a, you go to the movie, you could uh, get your bottle of pop for a nickel. You know, it was just a different world back there then. So if you want to visit Ray's museum and hear more of his enchanting stories from another time, he has a few suggestions. Some people call, some people just drop in, but like I say, uh, Please don't come the hottest day of the summer or the coldest day of the winter because it's not climate controlled by anything. It's just climate, if you want to call it, it's naturally controlled by Mother Nature. If you'd like to purchase a copy of any Heartland Highways program, just visit our online store at weiu.net. DVDs are available for $20 each. Visa, MasterCard, or Discover are accepted. If you prefer, you can call in your order at 1-877-727-9348. Just let us know what show you're interested in by mentioning the story name or the person featured in the show. Please allow four to six weeks for delivery. You might remember a story a few weeks ago about gardener Larry Shobe. In this final story, we're going to meet his friend and mentor, Wes Whiteside, who has an equally impressive garden about five miles from Charleston. Even when I was quite young, I always planted a vegetable garden, probably fifth grade, you know, along about in there, maybe even a little before then. And then when I got into eighth grade, I suddenly got interested in ornamental plants and wildflowers and from then on I knew that's what I wanted to make a living with is something with plants. Wes would spend his entire professional career working with plants as a professor of botany, retiring from Eastern Illinois University after 27 and a half years. After moving to Charleston in the 1960s, he sought out a piece of land not too far from town, hoping it would include some trees and a creek. What he bought was farmland with a limited number of trees, a creek, and a lot of work. But I decided to try and clean up this valley back of the house uh, because that was an abandoned pasture with grass several feet high. And, and blackberries and poison ivy and old machinery scattered around and the dead elms and, and the next spring I started planting back there. Little little tiny things that didn't cost very much and a lot of the things I dug up along the woods, you know, the roadsides and the woods and brought in little seedling dogwoods and things like that. With plenty of space to spare and a degree in botany, Wes took on the challenge of growing non-native and rare plants. A lot of them died, but a few of them made it, and some of them are pretty big plants now. 
I'm growing the Ben Franklin tree, the Franklinia. And I remember reading about that in the past and thought that, that uh, we probably just couldn't grow it here. In fact, uh, when I lived in Maryland, one of the garden centers I went to had little plants of them in pots, not only, they only charged a couple dollars for. And I brought back a few plants from this garden center, but I thought Franklinia probably wouldn't make it here, but it does surprisingly well here. Wes finds his interesting plants from mail order nurseries on the east or west coast. But plants alone won't guarantee success, so I asked him what was his secret. A lot of it is luck, but a lot of it is peat moss. Massive amounts of peat moss in the soil. <laughs> Sphagnum peat moss and old sunken bathtubs help Wes grow carnivorous plants like the Venus flytrap and the pitcher plant. In addition to experimental plants, Wes also grows more traditional trees, shrubs, and flowers, but on a larger scale. From spring to late fall, the garden blooms and changes. Wes is particularly proud of his rose garden. Many of the varieties are older ones, introduced after World War II. I start many of, have started many of them from cuttings. Many of them grow root surprisingly easily from cuttings. And uh, it takes the plants several years to build up size, but they make often a, a better plant than the grafted plants. Wes has also taken an interest in daylilies, which typically bloom in late June and July. He wanted a variety that would bloom in late August and September, so he's developed his own hybrid after years of trial and error. They're not nearly as fancy as, and as diverse as the typical mid-season ones, but I figure, well, Dozens and dozens of people have been working on these mid-season ones and so and they've been doing it for certainly for uh, at least 50 years and, and I don't feel so badly that that the mid-season ones are just a little fancier than what I have <laughs> for my late ones. But it, I'm making some progress. I can, see, I can see a difference in them. On any given day throughout the year, unless it's too cold, Wes can be found working alone in the garden. He said he's not a TV watcher, so this is a better alternative and a more pleasant way to spend his time. He's even devised a simple way for people to get a hold of him if he's out in the garden. A ring of the bell will signal your arrival. As far as expansion goes, Wes says that five acres is enough for him to handle, but he always leaves room to try something new each year. Public tours of the garden happen every year on Memorial Weekend at the Garden Ramble, a fundraiser for the Coles County Historical Society. It's a must for any gardening enthusiast. After spending time with Wes, one thing I realized is that he's very modest about his accomplishments. He's worked primarily as a one-man operation over the years and has created one of the most treasured and important gardens in the area. Thanks for joining us this week from Pemberton Hall. And you know, we get some of our best story ideas from viewers like you, so if you have one, feel free to shoot us an email. Sounds good. We'll see you next time. Heartland Highways is made possible in part by Consolidated Communications, offering customers high-speed internet, phone service, and digital TV service packages that include high-definition channels, DVR, and hundreds of sports, movies, and music channels. More information on these services available at Consolidated.com. 
I need some coffee or pop or something. Okay. <laughs> Fred never takes the first day. <laughs> okay. There he has what he calls a barn museum that houses hundreds of articles <laughs> cataloging life on the homestead dating. I remember a story from a few weeks ago about <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Don't start laughing. Three, two, one. Hey. 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 Hey, what's hey. up? Y'all, thanks for joining. What's up? <laughs> Dude. Dude. Thanks for joining us. Dude, thanks. We'll see you next time.